people. Tell me you're using that microphone now. Yeah, um, as people may know, I presume most people here understand that the Bolshevik tendency wants to see a Russian military victory in the current conflict in Ukraine, which is part of the takes a position of defeatism on both sides. Now, most left groups which take a dual defeatist position in this conflict, including the Trotskyist fraction, Socialist Action, and our former comrades in the IBT, view Russia as an imperialist power, which is qualitatively equivalent to the United States, Germany, France, Britain, etc. For these comrades, the conflict is essentially a struggle between rival imperialists. Uh, the SL, however, which correctly rejects the notion that Russia is an imperialist power, as we do, has since February 2022 described the war as a, quote, regional conflict between two non-imperialist capitalist classes. That's from the Spartacus 67, August 22. Now, this, this position contrasts with the SL's analysis from January 2014, when in the midst of the fascist-led Maidan revolution, so-called, Workers Vanguard commented, quote, the ongoing aim of the Western imperialists is to establish a client state on the border of Russia, and Ukraine would be a big prize, unquote. It is a big prize. Six weeks after that article was written, in an article headlined, Ukraine coup, spearheaded by fascists, backed by U.S. slash EU imperialists, the SL asserted, quote, in intervening in Crimea, Putin is seeking to defend the interests of capitalist Russia against the Western imperialists who are attempting to establish a client state on his border, unquote. The article correctly situated the creation of a Ukrainian proxy within the context of the overall imperialist strategy. Again, a quote from the article. In its constant drive for world hegemony, the U.S. has been trying to curtail Russia's strength as a regional power, continuously expanding NATO into East Europe and attempting to install plant regimes in former, in former Soviet republics. The U.S. has also established bases across Central Asia and elsewhere on Russia's periphery. This military extension is aimed at the encirclement not only of capitalist Russia, but also of China. That's Workers' Vanguard 2014 aimed at China. Uh, encircling Russia with U.S. client states and military bases does indeed pose a threat to the Chinese to form worker state. By resisting NATO's expansion into Ukraine, Russia is therefore defending not only itself, but also indirectly defending China. And this is why revolutionaries have a side in this struggle, or should have a side, and why the SL is wrong to sit it out. When Russia moved into Crimea in 2014, Workers Vanguard correctly observed, quote, the Western imperialists and their media loudly howl about Russian aggression in Crimea, but Putin's intervention is essentially defensive, including to protect Russia's Black Sea fleet based in Sevastopol. WV reported how, that's the end of the quote, WV reported how Ukraine's new prime minister, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who had been handpicked by the U.S. State Department, went to Brussels only a few days after he took office. And who did he meet in Brussels? But the NATO Secretary General. And the NATO Secretary General promised, quote, to strengthen our efforts to build the capacity of the Ukrainian military, including with more joint training and exercises, unquote. And NATO was true to that promise. That's what they did for the next seven or seven and a half years. <laughs> On the 2nd of May 2014, Workers' Vanguard proclaimed, quote, we opposed the recent U.S.-backed Ukrainian coup that was spearheaded by the fascists and stand in opposition to the Kiev regime's provocative military forays into eastern Ukraine. We oppose U.S.-EU sanctions against Russia and the U.S.-NATO military presence in the Baltics and elsewhere in East Europe, unquote. The logic of that position, comrades, which the SL has yet to formally renounce to our knowledge, should obviously be to militarily support the Kremlin's special military operation to kick NATO out of Ukraine. But instead, you are refusing to take sides. For years, U.S. strategists have been discussing how breaking up Russia into several smaller states could eliminate it as a geopolitical rival and also open its vast natural resources for exploitation by Western corporations. The big new Brzezinski, who you may recall was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, 
And Dick Cheney was well known as the defense secretary during the attack on Iraq and the first and Jimmy Carter's the first Iraq war, the first Gulf War, and subsequently became the vice president under Bush two. So both of them, Cheney and Brzezinski, were both enthusiastic supporters of this strategy of breaking Russia up, solving the Russian problem. But it's not just in 20 years ago this has been mooted. It's a continuing project. In September 2022, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe sponsored an event in Warsaw, which was entitled Decolonizing the Russian Empire. Decolonizing. On 23 June this year, the U.S. Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is a U.S. governmental body, held a congressional briefing. And the briefing was entitled Decolonizing Russia, a Moral and Strategic Imperative. The briefing was pitched as, quote, a long overdue conversation about Russia's interior empire, given Moscow's dominion over many indigenous non-Russian nations and the brutal extent to which the Kremlin has taken to suppressing their national self-expression and self-determination. So that's what they're discussing. Now, articles discussing decolonization and breaking up the Russian Federation have appeared recently within the last year or two in a variety of American publications, including The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, The Hill, and Radio Free Europe. Are you comrades in the Spartacus League actually unaware of this longstanding imperialist appetite to carve up Russia? Is this news to you? Can't you see why Russia's rulers would view this as a serious threat and why they would have popular support in Russia for such a view? And why they were therefore motivated to launch their special military operation in Ukraine to counter this project? Putin, of course, we hold no brief for. He is a reactionary Bonapartist. He is a homophobe. He is a great Russian chauvinist and an enemy of the working class. But this conflict is not about support to or opposition to Putin's regime. It's about preventing Ukraine from becoming a frontline NATO state on Russia's border. Western pundits loudly proclaimed when this conflict broke out that Russia's unprovoked, as they all call it, unprovoked intervention had nothing to do with NATO's expansion. Totally unrelated. If Putin was driving, he was going to end up in the English Channel soon after reconquering all the Warsaw Pact. 20 years earlier, of course, many of the same people have been saying that the American intervention in Iraq had nothing to do with seizing oil assets in the Middle East. But on September the 7th, just two months ago, Jan Stoltenberg, who's currently the Secretary General of NATO, casually confirmed that NATO expansion had indeed triggered the conflict when he said, quote, that Putin had, quote, wanted us to sign that promise never to enlarge NATO. He wanted us to remove our military infrastructure and all allies that have joined NATO since 1997. We rejected that. So he went to war to prevent NATO, more NATO, close to his borders. That's the NATO General Secretary. His explanation is what triggered the war. We think he's right about that. NATO military installations on Russia's borders vastly increase the risk of a preemptive first strike. As Theodore Postol, who is a very eminent U.S. rocket scientist based at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has explained. And that's because Russian satellite surveillance lags considerably behind American and NATO's. So Moscow needs more time to detect and potentially respond in the event of a hostile attack. And having Ukraine as a neutral, non-militarized buffer provides that time. We in the BT defend Russia's right to sever Ukraine's NATO connection as an elementary act of self-defense. And this question is at the core of the current conflict, as even Stoltenberg acknowledges. But ESL has chosen to avoid this. They don't address it. Or they should address it. Or they can't address it, I believe. Maybe they will. The assertion that this is merely a regional conflict between two 
Dependent capital supporters disease completely ignores the geostrategic imperatives that are driving NATO's proxy war against Russia. The refusal to take sides in this conflict represents a significant, if unacknowledged, line shift from the SL's earlier recognition that NATO expansion aimed not only at Russia, but also at the Chinese to foreign worker state. I think that in this case, James Robertson's aphorism about program determining theory helps illuminate the origins of this abrupt programmatic shift, which rationalized sidestepping military support to the Kremlin's attempt to denatalize Ukraine. I'm sure we all remember the frenzied bourgeois propaganda in defense of poor little Ukraine in February 2022. The pressure was intense. The ruling class was on the war path and capital city logs on every strike from right-wing libertarians to radical left liberals were all hysterically denouncing Russian imperialism. At such moments, it is not easy to stand up and tell the simple truth. The SL did so in 1979, when there was a similarly intense propaganda campaign about Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. And again, two years later in 1981, the SL again displayed the ability to swim against the stream when it denounced Lekulesa Solidarnosc as an instrument of capitalist counter-revolution. But in 2022, the SL capitulated and ignoring its previous description of Zelensky's fascist riddled regime as a NATO proxy proclaimed, quote, this is a war between two non-imperialist countries, unquote. Spartacus 57, August 22, page 48. The SL was not the only tendency to shift from denouncing the 2014 Maidan coup, which Victoria Newland said had cost the U.S. $5 billion to set up, to switch from that stance to one of neither Washington nor Moscow. The Internationalist Group and David North's World Socialist website also flinched in February 2022 when push came to shove. Six months later, as enthusiasm for NATO's Ukrainian puppet began to wane, the IG walked back its original capital capitulation and belatedly adopted a Russian defensive position. While we welcome this correction, we criticize the IG's clumsy attempt to attribute their flip-flop to a change in the objective situation. The SL made a parallel criticism, correctly observing that, quote, Ukraine has been a proxy for the imperialists going back to 2014. Imperialist weapons flooded Ukraine at the very outset of the conflict, and military operations have been coordinated with NATO throughout. Quite right. But the fact that Ukraine has been a proxy for the imperialists going back to 2014 is precisely why revolutionaries cannot be neutral in this fight. In the latest Spartacus, you comrades correctly observed, quote, the essential starting point must be that this is the imperialist system itself, defined today as the U.S. dominated liberal order that is responsible for the conflict in Ukraine. The same article states, quote, the two decisive actors in the Ukraine war are Russia and the U.S. Let me repeat that it's on page 32 for those who've got the current issue open. Right. The two decisive actors in the Ukraine war are Russia and the U.S. Again, very true. Russia and the U.S. are indeed the two decisive factors. <laughs> how can you then characterize this as a war between two non-imperialist countries? Surely we all agree the U.S. is imperialist. The current Spartacist article stipulates that, quote, and again quoting, NATO and Russia are engaged in a proxy war, unquote, which, quote, broke out as a result of decades of eastward NATO expansion. Russia sees Ukraine as a vital strategic interest. For the Western liberal establishment, defending Ukraine is about defending the liberal world order, i.e. the right of the United States to do as it pleases wherever it wants. Unfortunately, it's very unlikely that NATO will suffer defeat at the hands of an insurgent, class-conscious Russian-Ukrainian workers' movement, which we would all like to see, I'm sure. But it's also very clear that the imperialist proxy is going down. The Ukrainian army has taken horrendous casualties, and it appears to be nearing collapse. While the economic sanctions against Russia have failed in a spectacular fashion, there are very few options left for NATO that don't potentially risk escalating the conflict to a nuclear one, which is something the American bourgeoisie would obviously prefer to avoid. And I'm sure we would all prefer that they avoid it as well. 
The current Spartacist correctly observes that a Russian military victory would be, quote, a humiliating blow for the U.S. It would signal weakness, have destabilizing consequences for Europe's political establishment, and place a question mark over NATO's future. Again, page 32. What's not to like about that? Why does the ESL not welcome the prospect of imminent imperialist defeat? What's not to welcome about the potential collapse of NATO? The 7th February 2022, going back a couple of years, WB, discussed Washington's use of its Ukrainian proxy, and it observed, quote, what is criminal is that the U.S. continues to arm and finance Kiev in this proxy war against the East Ukraine insurgents. Echoing one witness during Trump's trial, the Democrats' House impeachment czar, Russell Folk Adam Schiff, raved, the United States aids Ukraine and her people so that they can fight Russia over here, over there, and we don't have to fight Russia here, unquote. Adam Schiff, major Democratic politician. Schiff's view is shared by many other leading American politicians. Last August, after he visited Kiev with fellow member of the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee, Elizabeth Warren, Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal proclaimed, quote, Ukraine is at the tip of the spear, fighting our fight for independence and freedom. U.S. imperialism's fight for independence and freedom. Ukraine, tip of spear. Blumenthal continued, quote, we're getting our money's worth on our Ukrainian investment. For less than 3% of our nation's military budget, we've enabled Ukraine to degrade Russia's military strength by half, all without a single American servicewoman or man injured or lost. What a bargain for U.S. imperialism. Mitt Romney, who I'm sure you'll recall is the former Republican presidential candidate, characterized military support for Ukraine as, quote, the best national defense spending I think we've ever done. Why is that? Well, Romney explained, quote, we're diminishing and devastating the Russian military for a very small amount of money. A weakened Russia is a good thing, unquote. And then Romney went on to explicitly link the war in Ukraine to the looming fight with China. And he said, quote, the single most important thing we can do to strengthen America relative to China is to see Russia defeated in Ukraine. A weakened Russia deters the CCP's territorial ambition. Supporting Ukraine is in our interest. Romney's right. Russian defeat in Ukraine would vastly strengthen America relative to China, as well as in relation to Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, and any other potential target of U.S. imperialism. Conversely, of course, a Russian military victory will weaken America relative to China. Presumably, the SL comrades can understand this simple equation. So how can you be neutral? I want to conclude with a few comments on your proposal to the IG to open up a serious and, in our view, long overdue discussion of Spartacus history. There is a problem, we think, in only looking back as far as 1990, which is what you propose. And the problem is the SL went off the rails as a revolutionary organization substantially before that. In 1978, Liz Gordon, who is still director of party publications, I see in Workers' Vanguard, was harshly attacked for daring to suggest that a single line in a draft co-authored by Jim Robertson might be unbalanced. In fact, the line was unbalanced. You can go back and read your IDPs and try to form conclusions on that, but I, I'm certain you will agree with me. Um, or, oh, sir. And Robertson, at, at the height of this, threatened to split the Spartacist League over. He threatened to split the group over the fact that somebody had dared to suggest that one line in the draft he'd done was unbalanced. There's something that was unbalanced, <laughs> but it wasn't the line. Later the same year, Robertson launched something called, known as the Clone Purge, which he himself, I was at the meeting, and he described it as a sub-political, unquote, struggle. It was a sub-political struggle that permanently crippled the Spartacus League's once promising youth organization, Spartacus Youth League. In 1979, 
as a few of us in this room today can recall, very few, the central event at the founding conference of the International Spartacy was a show trial of Bill Logan on charges of seriously mistreating young carmines in Australia. Logan was indeed guilty of that. But the allegation that he bore sole responsibility was a brazen lie. His actions were known to and approved by Robertson and the rest of the SL's top leadership, as we've documented in a, a completely uh, in a pamphlet available on our literature table and also available to read for free on our website called On the Logan Show Trial. And it's based on two, pam two pamphlets that the Spartacist League themselves published on that incident. And we just we, we go through and point out the multiple contradictions and the proof in the Spartacist League's own publications that the Logan trial, the Logan charges were essentially a lie. Logan was guilty, but it wasn't the only one who was guilty. This travesty provided a template for future frame-ups, including the crooked trial, which you comrades have now renounced, that featured in the 1996 purge of the IG. In the early 1980s, the SL began making a series of overtly programmatic deviations from Trotskyism, the first of which was marching around under the banner of the Salvadoran Popular Front. The next year, the SL was saluting Yuri Andropov, the Soviet bureaucrat who oversaw the suppression of the 1956 Hungary, Hungarian workers' political revolution. In 1983, the SL leadership called for saving the survivors of the Islamic Jihad truck bombing that blew the U.S. Marines out of Lebanon. Any genuine revolutionary would view that attack, which Hezbollah's leader Nasrallah more or less took credit for last week, uh, as a welcome blow against imperialism. But the SL leadership did not. This cowardly social patriotic flinch was unprecedented in the history of the Spartan presidency, although it was later paralleled paralleled by the refusal to take an Afghan defenses position in 2001 after the U.S. invaded. In recent correspondence with the new SL leadership, Comrade Norton rightly objected to the SL provocateur baiting of the IG. We agree that this filthy smear should be formally retracted by the SL, but we also recall several similarly odious slanders aimed at us in Spartacus' publication during Norton's tenure as WV article, uh, WV editor, which he and the SL must also repudiate. To date, the desire of comrades Perot and David to chart a new course has unfortunately mostly seemed to involve renouncing things that Robertson got right, like warning the Iranian leftists not to stick their heads in Khomeini's noose, and rejecting the ANC Stalin's Menshevik Freedom Charter, which advocated reforming rather than smashing the South African apartheid state. The current state of programmatic flux in the Spartacist tendency has not surprisingly created a lot of confusion within the cadre. We saw this six weeks ago in Toronto, when we asked John Masters, the Canadian section's long-standing leading comrade, been in the group almost 50 years, whether you still uphold a position of dual defeatism in the Arab-Israeli wars of 1948, 1967, and 1973. We had to ask three times before John finally indicated he didn't know. He didn't know if you still support it or not, or if you've changed your position. Perhaps someone here can answer that rather important question today. We certainly hope that this debate and your forthcoming debate with the IG in New York will mark the beginning of a serious warts and all discussion of Spartacus' history. We consider this to be extremely important. Whatever its problems, the SL during the 1960s and 70s was the only genuinely Trotskyist tendency in the world. And the assimilation of its polit political legacy is, we believe, essential for the future rebirth of the Fourth International. Okay, Vincent, when you're ready. Tom, like many other C's in our recent correction, only material for the past. He is not wrong that a lot of our articles from 2014 were closer to his position, so I'm not going to defend them today. But I think what he hasn't grasped is the real nature of our position and what was really wrong with his article back in 2014. It's a sentence he didn't quote. It said, well, there's no revolutionary party in Ukraine and Russia, so no revolutionary perspective is possible. Something you echoed, actually, in your presentation. So that's what I'll answer. The essential starting point for Marxists regarding the war in Ukraine must be, as you quoted from us, 
that it is the imperialist system itself, defined today by the US-dominated liberal order that is responsible for it. Therefore, while this debate is titled Ukraine War, what strategy for Marxists? Really, the question is, what strategy to defeat imperialism? In the Ukraine war, we, the Spartacist League, are not neutral. We call on Ukrainian and Russian workers and soldiers to fraternize, turn their guns against their own ruling class with the aim of transforming this reactionary war between nations into a civil war against the ruling classes. And in the West, our modest forces have fought for the workers' movement to take action against the imperialist governments, and we have waged a constant struggle against the, the pro-imperialist leaders of the workers' movement, as well as against the pacifist deceivers, with the aim of building an anti-imperialist and revolutionary leadership of the working class. So for us, the cornerstone of a strategy to defeat imperialism rests entirely on putting forward an independent path of struggle for the proletariat against the imperialists and against all bourgeois forces in order to advance the struggle for working class power. That's what my, pre my presentation will be about and what I think you haven't heard so far. In contrast, the Bolshevik tendency for them, their strategy to defeat imperialism rests on supporting a victory of the Russian army in Ukraine. So what I will demonstrate in this presentation is that this position is reactionary and a complete obstacle to building a working class and revolutionary opposition to NATO and U.S. imperialism. And I will also demonstrate how the BT's approach to the war completely capitulates to the pro-imperialist leaders of the working class. Let's start with the character of the war. That is, what is it about? The BT's position is based on the fact that since Russia is not imperialist and since Ukraine is supported by the imperialist powers, they conclude that Russia is waging a just war of national defense against imperialism and that a defeat for Ukraine would be a defeat for the imperialists. On a superficial level, this could sound logical, except that this entire edifice shatters at the first contact with reality. First, the current war is not about dismembering or balkanizing Russia. Everyone knows that Russia is not fighting for its national sovereignty against an imperialist invasion. This war is not about who will control Russia. It is about who will control Ukraine. On the one side, the Ukrainian government is fighting to keep Ukraine under the boot of NATO, the European Union, and the United States. On the other side, Russia is fighting to bring Ukraine into its own sphere of influence. Therefore, this is a war about which gang of thugs, that of the White House or that of the Kremlin, will exploit and dominate Ukraine. And in the name of fighting imperialism, the BT is simply supporting one gang of thugs against the other. Second, the fact that this war is a proxy war between Russia and the U.S. does not mean that Marxists simply support Russia. The U.S. backs all sorts of regimes throughout the world, and Marxists do not just simply support, support any of their opponents. Also, the BT blurs the line between a proxy war and an imperialist war against Russia. For the BT, this is a secondary matter, a nuance. But for anyone who thinks, there is obviously a fundamental difference between NATO supplying weapons to Ukraine and NATO bombing Russian cities and invading Russia. To think otherwise is totally disorienting. The day the United States, the UK, and NATO declare war on Russia, it will fundamentally change the character of the war from a regional conflict over who controls Ukraine to a full-scale imperialist war to crush Russia. And believe me, when this happens, it will not be necessary to look through panels on decolonizing Russia and that kind of stuff. It would be very obvious to everyone. Thirdly, what appears like a strong argument of the BT is when they say that a defeat of Ukraine would be a blow to the imperialists. And since revolutionaries are for blows against imperialism, we must support Russia. This is a method which consists in putting a plus where the foreign office puts a minus. The advantage with this method is that you don't need to think to actually use it. The disadvantage, however, is that it has nothing to do with the living reality of the class struggle, therefore nothing to do with Marxism. 
It is simply not true that any blow whatsoever to the imperialists automatically advances the interests of the working class. In contrast, here is how Marxists must approach the question. The defining feature of our epoch and the context in which the Ukraine war takes place is the decline of U.S. hegemony. A growing number of forces are seeking to take advantage of this decline. So the entire question for Marxists, the entire question of our epoch, is whether this decline will happen through a spiral of crises, reaction, and wars, just like what we're starting to see, or will this decline further the, in the interest of the working class, that is, advance the cause of socialism? But this latter option is not a given. It requires the mobilization of the proletariat as an independent fighting force, armed with a revolutionary leadership. That is what the simplistic method and geopolitical facts of the BT disappears. The Marxist program is based not on blindly supporting blows to imperialism, but on the understanding that the only way to deal a decisive and progressive blow to imperialism is through workers' revolution. Therefore, a Marxist approach to the Ukraine war and a Marxist strategy against imperialism must be based on furthering the class struggle, on strengthening the unity of the international proletariat, and on advancing the struggle for socialist revolution. But all of this is completely alien to the BT. We haven't heard the word revolution so far. Who, because the BT strategy to combat imperialism relies not on the revolutionary struggle of the working class, but on Russia winning in Ukraine. To better understand how this position is completely anti-Marxist and frankly chauvinist, one simply has to think about what does supporting Russia mean in the real world. This is something the articles or the presentation today of the BT, which have a lot of theoretical <coughs> abstractions and quote, and which barely mention the working class, they, they never spell it out. So let me do it for them. According to the BT's position, the task of Ukrainian workers is to support the Russian army and do everything to facilitate the invasion of their own country. In other words, Ukrainian workers are supposed to welcome their own national oppression at the hands of the Russian oligarchs. The national oppression of Ukraine is in no way in the interest of the international working class. Ukrainian workers will never accept this position, and this position only contributes to discrediting communism in Ukraine and pushes workers into the arms of Zelensky uh, the wretched Ukrainian nationalists and the imperialist powers. So what about Russian workers? The, PT, the BT's position tells them that they must support the war effort of the Russian government. This means that the BT denounces the most class-conscious class workers in Russia who want to oppose the war and the predatory aims of the Russian oligarchs. And indeed, when workers in Belarus refuse to move armed shipments, the BT denounced this. Furthermore, According to the BT's line, communists should attack Putin for not having committed enough resources to the invasion of Ukraine. This totally aligns the BT with Russian nationalists who believe that Ukraine is Russia or that Ukraine does not even exist. And the BT's position echoes this. So one of their key arguments, which you quoted, is that uh, uh, revolutionaries recognize that Russia's right to self-defense includes the right to severe NATO's uh, Ukraine's NATO connection. So for the BT, Russia has not only a right to invade its neighbor, but the conquest of Ukraine is a progressive cause. This is simply great Russian chauvinism and means educating Russian workers in this spirit. So it is when you leave the sphere of abstraction and geopolitics and actually try to apply to living reality, the thinking of the BT, that one can fully realize its completely reactionary implications. What Russian workers must understand is precisely that whatever short-term blow a Russian victory would inflict on U.S. foreign policy, it is not worth the price of Russia becoming the oppressor of Ukraine. The subjugation of Ukraine will not help in any way to free Russia from imperialist encirclement. It will only help to bolster the authority of Zelensky and his imperialist masters who can fraudulently present themselves as the defenders of small nations. And more broadly, it only fuels nationalist poison in the entire region, 
further binding workers to, the exploit, to their exploiters, be they Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, Lithuanian, etc., thus creating new obstacles to the unity of the working class and to workers' revolution. And at the end of the day, the one force which will benefit from this are the imperialist power themselves who will be able to use this carnival of reaction to strengthen their position in the region. The way to deal a decisive blow against imperialism in Eastern Europe is through building a common revolutionary front of Ukrainian and Russian workers against their common enemy, the imperialists, and against their respective capitalist classes. If Ukrainian workers defend Russian minorities, fraternize with Russian conscripts, and oppose NATO and the U.S., this will deliver a much greater blow to the Russian capitalists than any of Zelensky's counter-offensive. If Russian workers take a stand against the oligarchs war, against Russian chauvinism, and seek revolutionary unity with the Ukrainian workers, this will deliver a much greater blow to NATO and the imperialists than any Russian counter-offensive. That is the communist strategy to defeat imperialism. That is the orientation we are pursuing. And I think if you, if you think in these terms, it becomes obvious how the VT's position is a total obstacle to the unity of the working class and to any revolutionary perspective. Now, there is another argument used by the VT, which is that a Russian victory would help to defend China, the deform worker states, and neo-colonies against imperialism. I think you called it like a basic understanding. I would call this actually a basic revision of Trotskyism. Trotsky taught us that the only way to defend worker states like China is by fighting for workers' revolution to overthrow imperialism and for political revolution to overthrow the Stalinist bureaucracy. That is the only way to weaken imperialism and strengthen the position of the proletariat internationally. The further the international socialist revolution progresses, the better protected is China. The weaker the international proletariat is, the more it is subordinated to its exploiters, the more vulnerable is China. This is the simple truth which was repudiated by Stalin and the doctrine of socialism in one country. And the position, the basic understanding of the BT is actually cut out of the same cloth. As we have seen, support to Russia divides and weakens the proletariat in Eastern Europe and beyond, creating new obstacles to workers' revolution. And the BT strategy to defend China is not based on the independent mobilization of Chinese workers against Stalinism and imperialism, nor on the struggle of the workers' movement internationally for socialism, but on the military successes of the Russian bourgeoisie in Ukraine. This is the same method which led Stalin to place the fate of the defense of the USSR on the British trade union leaders, on the Kuomintang, and later on the imperialist powers themselves with disastrous results. In the last analysis, the method of the VT is much closer to the advocates of the multipolar world who promote the BRICS, Xi Jinping, and Putin as anti-imperialist forces. The BT might say they oppose Putin or Xi, but just like the advocates of the BRICS alliance, they do not view the struggle against imperialism from the standpoint of an independent proletarian road of struggle. And without this crucial element, whatever criticism of Putin you have, you end up as a left critic of him in a typical Pabloite manner. Now, I want to bring the debate here, to Britain. Since the beginning of the Ukraine war, the leadership of the working class, from the Labour Party to the trade unions, has played a key role in lining up the workers' movement behind the interests of British imperialism. This, the same has been happening in Germany, France, the United States. There can be no talk of a Marxist strategy in the Ukraine war or in any war, like in Palestine today, without a ruthless struggle against the pro-imperialist leaders of the workers' movement, what Lenin called the social chauvinists, as well as against the pacifist deceivers and those leftists who maintain unity with the social chauvinists, what Lenin called the opportunists and the centrists. And it is in this field 
even more per se than Ukraine, that the political bankruptcy of the Bolshevik tendency becomes even more evident. Since the outbreak of the war, the BT has not published a single article attacking the leaders of the working class in Britain for their support to British imperialism. <clears throat> Britain was shaken by a strike wave last year, and the BT has not written a single article on this. While the burning task of communists was to drive a wedge between the, the, the working class and the pro-imperialist program of the leaders, which is what led the strike wave to defeat, the BT stood by and did nothing. So just contrast this with us for a second. Our initial declaration on the war in Ukraine attacked frontally all social chauvinist leaders and pacifists. Our comrades in Germany have been at the forefront of the fight against the pro-NATO and EU supporters in the German left. And here, despite our modest size, the Spartacist League Britain threw all its energy into declaring war on the social chauvinist leaders of the workers' movement. We organized a protest against the monarchy and against the union leaders canceling the strikes when the Queen crowed. We launched a campaign to build picket line against the union leaders, sabotaging them. We intervened at the last TUC Congress against the union bureaucrats voting support for more arms to Ukraine, denouncing the social chauvinists and the impotent pacifist opposition of, stop, of the Stop the War Coalition. Almost the entire left in this country supports and campaigns for Sharon Graham, the leader of Unite, lauding her as a militant while she is a staunch supporter of British imperialism and arms for Ukraine. We have intervened in almost all Trotskyist groups denouncing them for their support to the social chauvinists as a betrayal which obstructs uh, working class action against British imperialism. Over the last year and a half, we have written over a dozen articles exposing how the support of trade union leaders and laborites to British imperialism, and in particular to Ukraine, and now Israel, is precisely what obstructs both working class action against the war, but also the most minimal economic struggles. We have tirelessly mobilized our small forces in the trade unions to fight for a new leadership of the working class, one that opposes imperialism and organizes the day-to-day -day struggle of our class as part of a broader strategy for workers' power. So, comrades of the Bolshevik tendency, what have you been doing in the last two years to advance working class and anti-imperialist struggles in this country? What have you been doing to advance the most crucial task of revolutionaries? That is to split the working class from its social chauvinist and pacifist leaders and expose their centrist conciliators. Because even with a position for Russia, you could do some of this. If the BT, despite its support to Russia, was fighting like hell against the Sharon Graham, the Dave Ward and the Mick Lynch, and for an anti-imperialist poll in the workers' movement, we would have had a couple of United Fronts already, and we would now have a very different conversation. But the reality is that you have done none of this. And in this way, you are not so different than all other groups in this country who claim to be for communism, against NATO, against imperialism, for or against Ukraine but who all agree on one thing, unity with the social chauvinist and pro-imperialist leaders of the working class. To wage war on such unity is the utmost duty of revolutionaries. That is what Lenin hammered throughout World War I. You say that the Ukraine war was a litmus test for Trotskyists? That is the litmus test. That is what the Spartacist League is doing, and that is what the BP refuses to do. And the other reality come full circle is that your position for a victory to Russia completely undermines this struggle, even if you were to engage in it, for the simple reason that your position means supporting the Russian ruling class's subjugation of Ukraine. And any class-conscious worker who wants to fight British imperialism also understand that Russia's war is not progressive and wants to have nothing to do with it, and rightly so. That is the other way in which your position divides the international working class. Lastly, and I will conclude on this, while the BT capitulates to Russian nationalism, I do not believe this is the motivation behind your support to Russia. I believe you have arrived at this wrong position because of a wrong method. Because you do not view Marxism as a guide for the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat, but rather as sterile and abstract doctrines or formula and geopolitics. And I'm not trying to be demagogic here, it's true. 
the organization has split from the IET before the current oil war on a purely analytical question, whether Russia is imperialist with the IBT believing it is and the BT believing it isn't. You have thus revealed in this way to the entire world that for you, the condition for unity or split in the communist movement was agreement over an analytical description, not over what to fight for, what to do. And your articles on the war in Ukraine follow this method. They are constructed as a succession of quotes from multiple geopolitical source or socialist group in which you comment on the analysis, right or wrong, and then you observe the left's refusal to side with Russia. For you, the analysis is decisive. It generates the program. But for Marxists, and funny enough, you mentioned this, the program, that is, what do you fight for now, drives the analysis. And indeed, in all your articles, never do you make the case as to why and how your position advances the struggle of the working class for its emancipation. But you see, comrades, that's, that's the entire purpose of Marxism, to offer an independent path of struggle for the proletariat. And today, there is a new war raging in Palestine. And we can talk about 1948, but here's the thing. You have not written, uh, written a thing on the war now. You have been, instead posted a couple of pictures of U.S. demonstration carrying slogans, correcting themselves, but that are totally acceptable to any left liberal, Palestinian nationalist, or social democrat who read and take part in these marches. This is not serious. You have to guide the struggle against the current illusion. Down with Zionist terror doesn't combat anything in these marches. Marxism is a guide to struggle, not for reader circles comparing analysis. And you will notice that throughout my presentation, it is on this basis that I expose your position in the war. That, it, that is, that it's a capitulation to the various misleaders of the working class, Ukrainian or Russian nationalists, social chauvinists, laborite pacifists, and, etc., and is thus an obstacle to pushing forward the struggle of the working class against world imperialism. Okay, well, um, life must be different in Britain than it is in Canada, because I can tell you that in Canada, every liberal um, isn't in favor of, for a binational, secular, socialist state in Palestine, Israel, which is one of the slogans which Cameron might not be aware of, and we have various others that I don't think are embraced by liberals as a general. Um, similarly, the idea that we are advocating a strategy of defending the Chinese worker state by Russian victory in Ukraine, really, comrade, it's a bit of a stretch. I mean, you know, there are a lot of stretch points for polemics, but uh, if you were actually seriously interested in our position, you can read the article that we wrote on Marx and Deng. It's pretty clear that we need a political revolution in China for a variety of reasons. But the question that we're really discussing today the issue, and it's kind of, you know, there's a tendency, I think, to, to think a, a bit cloudily about this on the part of my um, co-participant, is, uh, is there a side in this conflict which is, the victory or defeat of which is going to benefit the working class internationally? That's, that's the real question. And the idea of who published how much and winning how many leaflets and what demands, et cetera, is, is you know, that's a matter of the capacity of the group. You may have intervened very effectively to turn the Labour Party or most of it, or I, I don't know what exactly you've been doing concretely. But if we're talking about what position to take on a conflict. Does the working class have an interest in the victory of one side or another? And frequently in those situations, um, for instance, the Spanish Civil War, siding with the victory of one side doesn't imply support to the leadership or wanting to see that regime triumph ultimately. It's just that in this particular conflict, one victory or one defeat will move the struggle forward or it will not. And I suggest to you that uh, that a victory, and you in fact in your own literature have suggested that a Russian victory will be a defeat for the Imperials, will disorient them, uh, and may shatter NATO. I think you're right. I think that would be a good thing. Um, you know, depending, in, regardless of how who hands out how many leaflets at which labor conference. And that's how Marxists have to look at it. I mean, you, you see this as abstractly flying over, but we need, a, we need an overall orientation to global politics and to what's going on to address concretely 
the circumstances and our ability to address and how much, you know, what our capacity is to intervene in particular instances is one issue. But the fundamental issue is what is the basic line? What's the basic orientation? And the responsibility of Marxist leadership is to provide and equip the working class with an understanding of objective reality, which allows it to then correctly orient to, do we have a side in World War II? Well, Hitler's bad, should we, you know, or not? And this is a similar case. The workers do objectively have an interest. Now, the comrade brushes aside, you know, oh, well, we don't care about what studies are underway, but he called it. You may not care about it, but this is how imperialists operate. They're doing contingency plans for taking down Russia, and they're saying explicitly and repeatedly, as I indicated, well, you know, empirical quotes, we don't care about that. You should care about it. They're outlining their strategy. Step one is to weaken Russia. Step two is to break Russia up into small pieces and appropriate all its wealth. Step three is to take down this Chinese deformed worker state, which is a real problem for global imperialism. This project is not going well. They are losing. That's good. And the working class should understand that that's good. Okay, so I've got a few questions for you. If Russia and the U.S. are indeed the two decisive actors, how can you possibly characterize this as a war between two imperialist countries? You don't take seriously what you wrote in 2014, two non-imperialist countries. John Masters, Arab-Israeli wars of 48, 67, 73. You don't care about 48. You're more interested in what's going on in Gaza right now. But what is your position? That was a critical, central issue in global politics for the entire 20th century. And it distinguished the Spartans as late from every Pavloid and Neo-Pavloid Heliite who believed in the Arab Revolution, the unfolding Arab bourgeoisies with substitute for the working class. The Spartans as late said, no, we were right about that. Do you still stand on that, or do you know? I mean, John Masters doesn't know. Maybe if you don't know, then maybe the question's up for discussion. We can have another debate about that later. Thanks, Tom. That's all the time we've got. Quickly on China. I know you write in your paper that you're for political revolution and all that stuff. I'm not deforming. You maintain this formal orthodox position. But your only perspective right now, concretely, how to fight to defend China is limited to a Russian victory in Ukraine. That is the only concrete perspective as to how to fight for this. You would still have the ceremonial, yeah, we're for political revolution. But actually, and that article that you mentioned doesn't have also like a perspective of how to mobilize the proletariat in China against the Stalinists and in the imperialist countries, you know, against counter-revolution. There's no such a proletarian role. It's like a good, actually a theoretical like expose on like this book, but like on the lockdowns on Xi Jinping, you know, that's this kind of perspective that's not in your, in the article you mentioned. Okay, so you say, okay, let's bring down to the real question, a side. Is there a side that will benefit the working class? You mentioned Spain, you know, this is not a Marxist approach to things. The Marxist approach is how do we advance revolution out of this perspective? Trotsky's approach in Spain was not, well, we're for the Republican government, so that will be good if it wins. Trotsky's writing in the Spanish Revolution is always to use the situation, how can we push forward revolution? And at that particular juncture, yeah, it required a military side with the Republicans in order to overthrow the Republicans and the bourgeois Republicans. Now, it's not that I don't care about geopolitics, but you don't use geopolitics to advance a perspective for revolution. That's the thing. You look at the geopolitics, oh, the U.S. have a discussion saying they want to destroy Russia. Oh, we must defend Russia. But there's a difference between what the imperialists have in their mind, what they would wish, what is going on on the ground. And you have not addressed how a position for Russia disunites the working class in Eastern Europe, pits them against each other, builds new obstacles to revolution. And that's the central thing, you know. That's the point. Well, to say no, I hope other leaders will explain to me how a position for the victory of Russia will further the revolutionary unity and struggle of workers in Eastern Europe or here. And I'll just quickly on here. The point is not how many leaflet. The point I said, there can be no talk of a strategy against imperialism without a struggle against social chauvinism. 
you, you, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Lenin and all his writing during the war. That is the utmost duty of revolutionary to denounce and expose the, the leadership of the working class who supports imperialism, pits the basis of the trade union against that leadership. That's completely alien to anything you're pushing, whether in Britain or in Canada. I don't, honestly, I don't care. We can talk of any country, but certainly certain, that's in, in alien to your entire perspective. But you can't claim to be a revolutionary if you don't fight to advance the struggle of workers against their current misleaders, which is what your position doesn't do in Ukraine, in Russia, in Britain, anywhere. Because, and you haven't spoken about it. Israel Arab War, quickly, we have written a, an entire article repudiating the entire approach of the Spartacists since its founding, you know? And we are, we are um, uh, studying the position at the moment, and, and we are having discussion over the history of Israel and Palestine. That's, that's the answer. But however, one thing I would say, though, is that the position you're referring is from an article called uh, The Birth of the Zionist State. Do you, th that article doesn't say a pipe in defense of Palestinians. That article supports the borders of 1949 and the imperialist treaty that imposed them. So, like, I don't want to have necessarily the debate on all of this, and we can talk about Palestine, and, and I'd like to hear from Russia, but you know what? That's what that, uh, that article, you say, do you defend that? That's what it says, you know? So, no, we don't defend that article. Um, so, just quickly, the point I would like to orient the debate about and the point I've been trying to hammer, it's not about how many leaflet, because even if you're small, you have a duty to fight, you know, is offering an independent proletarian road to advance revolution. We're both claiming to be for revolution. Well, that must be the, 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 the kind of guiding judge as to who here has a revolutionary position. Uh, yeah, uh, Vincent, you mentioned that uh, this debate is taking place in a wider context of what strategy uh, for Marxists in opposing imperialism. And I think that's generally true. Um, and obviously, we have chosen to be at this debate rather than another manifestation of that happening out on the streets of London now, where we would presumably all have been on the demo about the uh, Zionist Israeli state's genocidal attack on Gaza. Um, as part of that, there are other attacks on imperialist forces uh, happening across the region. I presume people here are aware of the attacks on US bases in Syria and Iraq, for instance. Um, and I would assume that the Spartacist League comrades would uh, support us and would agree with us in military supporting those attacks, even though they're carried out by non-proletarian forces. <clears throat> um, for us, Revolutionary Marxists are for the kicking out of imperialist military forces out of the neo-colonies by any means necessary, with no conditions, immediately, unconditional. Now, I hope that the uh, Spartacist League would agree with us that they would militarily support those attacks on US bases. But I say hope because this hasn't always been the position of your organisation. And going back to before 1990, when you were... You've said you're looking back in the past of your positions, but I'm glad to hear that you're going further back and looking to the beginning, because in 1983, when a US Marine, Marine barracks was bombed in Lebanon, the Spartacist League placed a condition on the removal of the military imperialist force, and that was that they get out alive. Yeah. Do you stand on that position? Would you apply that in the current situation and say that you were for um, getting the US military troops out of Syria and Iraq alive? Or would you take our position or by any means necessary and military supporting those attacks, even though we have no political support for the various Islamic jihadist forces making those attacks? <coughs> Thank you. Just that question. Okay, and now a member of the Spartacist League. Okay. Oh, okay, I want to take up two questions that the speaker from the Bolshevik Tendency raised. Um, one is um, you've referred a lot to the intention of the U.S. rulers to dismember and break up Russia. 
There's a difference between their intentions and what they are actually doing. I don't dispute that Brzezinski and the likes would like to dismember Russia or that the U.S. want regime change in Russia, but that's not currently what they're doing. If they were doing it, we would all know, because they would be bombing Moscow and St. Petersburg back to smithereens, and that's not what's happening right now. If that was happening, that would indeed change the nature of the conflict, and we would have a different position. So you have to look at what is actually happening. I want to address also the question of how do you sever, you mentioned that you think Russia's attack on Ukraine is defensible because they're seeking to sever Ukraine's connection to NATO. So the question is, we all agree that we need to sever any connections to NATO. The question is, what is the agency? How do we do it? By invading Ukraine, what Russia guarantees is that every Ukrainian worker is actually going to want to fight to the death to be with the imperialists against Russia. It's going to reinforce the stranglehold of imperialism over the workers of Ukraine. What is it going to do for workers of Russia? For workers of Russia, it's going to consolidate them behind the aims of their own government, behind the appetites of their oligarchs, and it's going to go against any kind of appetite to fight those oligarchs in Russia. What does it do? It doesn't do anything to advance the struggle of imperialism in the Western countries either. And that's my last point, is your presentation was glaring in the total absence of any kind of perspective for the working class in the imperialist countries to do anything to fight against their own imperialism. Your only agency is in the Kremlin. I'm not saying you support Putin, but your only agency, the only way you can envisage an outcome to this war, a progressive outcome to this war, is by a military victory of the Russian forces. And you said yourself in your presentation that you didn't think that a united working class struggle on the part of Ukrainian Russian workers was on the cards. So you're looking for something else. You have 30 seconds. Okay. Last point. You say you're for Russia. You would agree with us that it is the duty of revolutionaries to fight for a split with the social chauvinists in the workers' movement. Even with a position for a Russian victory, you could fight alongside with us in the workers' movement in Britain against all those social chauvinists who are fading the likes of Sharon Graham, putting these people on their platforms, covering up their crimes. You could do that with a position for the victory of Russia. Thank you. But you haven't done it. That's all. For the first non-supporter of either side, I'm going to use my privilege to recognize myself. Sorry, everybody else. And there's plenty of time. And just raise a few questions. So let me time myself, to be fair. Two kind of interesting points that either side raised and that kind of seem to be stuck in a conflict. Tom asked at one point for going back to a deeper history of Spartacism and reinvestigating older problems in that tendency, not just to 1990. And Vincent kind of responded that he was saying not to be stuck in the past, but what's our orientation now? On the other hand, Vincent asked for a strategy that's actually oriented towards Ukrainian and Russian workers and towards revolution that would presumably be led by Ukrainian and Russian workers in those countries. And Tom, you made a comment, maybe you can kind of clarify this, that in reality there isn't a prospect for organizing Ukrainian workers or Russian workers necessarily in the present. So maybe you could kind of expand on that. And Vincent raised this issue of method. And Tom again raised this issue of what the reality is. And this kind of conflict between method and reality seems to point back to earlier splits in the history of Marxism, not just within Trotskyism, but going back to the Third International and even the Second International with the revisionist dispute. So speaking for myself, I can't discount the idea that actually there's no strategy for Marxists with respect to Russia and Ukraine. Because if we think about the point Vincent's raised, that it would need to be oriented towards organizing the working class independently, and Tom's point that there doesn't seem to be prospects for doing that, then I think we need to ask ourselves, is this really the litmus test? Or are there in fact deeper problems? 
Now, just to raise one of these problems, I think it would be interesting if we could all consider why it is that Trotskyism in various strands, but particularly Orthodox Trotskyism, has failed to provide the revolutionary leadership or to build the revolutionary parties oriented towards world socialist revolution, which it has claimed as its goal. Not just in the past 30 years, right, since disorientation following the collapse of the Soviet Union, but really for the past 80 years or more, right, it hasn't happened yet. And to the extent that we're stuck in this kind of conflict between method and reality, in which both sides, I think, seem to be right, then we need to raise how we address that deeper historical question. Is it, for example, that we're now fighting for leadership of the working class, as in the time of the Fourth International, or are we looking for splits and recruitments, as in the time of the New Left? So are these questions still relevant now? I've run out of time. I will now recognize a supporter of the BT. Yes, halfway at the front. Okay. Yeah, I think the SL get it wrong when they say, oh, because the Ukrainian military is losing at the moment, that that is indication that this is not about really NATO involvement at all. This is, you know, Ukraine fighting Russia. Rather than recognizing it as a first step to break up Russia, Brzezinski didn't explicitly link NATO eastward expansion to the breaking up of Russia. And it's reflected in the current situation. NATO doesn't want to go to direct war with Russia because that would lead to immediate nuclear holocaust. So the American rulers, German rulers as well, think it's much wiser to use the Ukrainians. We don't really care about them. It's a good investment for us. And that bears out even in terms of weaponry delivered. In November last year, the German government announced that due to the amount of ammunition they had delivered to the Ukrainians, the German army, if it had to fight a conventional war, would last for two weeks. Similar voices came out of the British government. And Stoltenberg said in November last year, oh, yeah, by June or so, we were running, we were running out of artillery shells. So clearly, NATO is throwing everything they have, including target intelligence, with which they try to attack Russia, including, well, that's an interesting question now. Is Crimea part of Russia or not? We believe it is. We believe that the people in Crimea have the right to self-determine where to go. But Ukraine, the Ukrainian government wants to reoccupy it against the will of the local population, just like the population in the Donbass, by the way. Are these not Ukrainians, according to your method? Hasn't imperialism used Galician nationalism, Western Ukrainian nationalism, to whip up hatred rather than sort of believing that Ukraine is this unified national state, as which it's currently portrayed? It doesn't, you know. Seconds. Yeah, Trotskyists have a way of dealing with low class consciousness. And I think we all know that the working class, unfortunately, has generally low class consciousness. And that is not always raising maximum demands, but sort of approaching things from a transitional program point of view. And so we don't put any conditions on the on who deals. Thanks. We'll wrap it up there. Now, I recognize the support of the Spartacus link. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Can I do that? Can you just speak a little? Oh, the speaker. Yeah.
Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, I guess I want to uh, address the question of method and reality, which the platypus, which the chair uh, pointed to, but really which is at the heart of this debate. So let me just give you the one-on-one -on, -one on Marxism. Marxism is about both, actually. There is no Marxism without rooting it in reality, right? The reality of the living class struggle that evolves and develops historically, based in different national contexts, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the starting point for Marxists is to actually see what's happening out there. But that's not it. That's only one half of it. The other half is, and, it, this, and it, it, if you lose sight of this, you are automatically in the bourgeois camp. The, the, the starting point has to be how to advance the independent interest, the world historic interest of the proletariat, right? And that, I'm sorry to say, is n was nowhere to be found in your debate, in your in, in your presentation, sorry, in your rebuttal, or in the two uh, two comments made by BT supporters. So, so I just want to highlight really how how you're approaching this whole question about how to fight imperialism, how to approach the Ukraine war. In contrast, in complete contrast. Uh, that our our our, pres uh, our presenter uh, he he drew a line precisely on this very question: what is happening in the region? From that reality, was taking as a starting point how to advance the interests not just of the Ukrainian Russian workers, but actually how to forge the unity of the international proletariat. That has been our starting point. That is a starting point of our correction, which you guys seem to have ignored by by constantly grudging that old crop. I don't know half of that stuff, you know what? And that doesn't stop me from yeah. fighting as a communist uh, in Britain against the social chauvinists, against my trade union leaders. So, I mean, I guess I just want to say uh, directly, Efrain, to you, there, there is an account of position between method and reality. You know, the minute you divorce those two things, you're, you're, you're some bourgeois, scholastic, academic, whatever. There isn't. And related to that, you know, it's not leaderships or splits and movements either. It's only when you're fighting for leadership that what that means is fighting for a clear revolutionary program that you're actually going to try and split organizations such as like this one or the IG that we're trying to approach. It's through fighting for splits that you're going to fight for the leadership and to reforge the forces. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to recognize a person of neither side, which will be the lady there. Yes. Um, okay, you're right to shout. Yes, I'm okay. fine. Thank you. I'm Barbara, I'm from the International Bolshevik Tendency. Um, Vincent made a rather odd comment earlier, which is also repeated in the latest article. He said, the imperialist system is defined by the US-dominated liberal order. I mean, yes, the US is the most powerful imperialist nation on the planet, but imperialism is not defined by this. Imperialism is defined by competition between the most powerful states on the planet for resources, sphere of influence, et cetera, et cetera. And that brings us to the Ukraine conflict, which can only be understood in the context of the inter-imperialist rivalries that have been building and building up in the world since the fall of the Soviet Union. And, um, to, and Russia, as we have documented in our press, and um, has over that time become an imperialist power, has become one of those um, oppressors on the world stage. And um, you can read the details of the building up of inter-imperialist rivalries in various articles that we've written, including one article where we go into a lot of detail about the economic basis of Russia as an imperialist power. But neither the Spartacist League or the BT understands this. You're both viewing this war wrong because you do not, you do not follow that. Um, the BT are at least a little bit more persistent, but the, the Spartacist League is interesting because you have somehow come to the, the right position of dual defeatism w without having had that analysis. And another interesting comment that Vincent made was um, that this war is about which gang of thugs will exploit Ukraine? <coughs> Russia is one of those thugs. <coughs> Russia is an imperialist power on the world stage. That is why we need to be dual defeatists in this conflict. Dual defeatism means in concrete, it means the workers' movement in Britain, <coughs> in all the, the um, imperialist powers involved in this conflict, including Russian workers, um, stopping weapons transports. That is how the, the work class, the workers' movement, 
can get involved here and um, fight for dual defeatism. That's what it means. Um, 20 seconds. Um, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we're now back to the start, so a supporter of the Bolshevik tendency. Anyway, that's what's open at the front here. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess 10 years ago, when you read an issue of Spartacist, you got a pretty good idea of what their line is, what they were thinking. Sometimes you agreed, sometimes you disagreed. These days, if you read an issue of Spartacist, it's kind of difficult to work out uh, what they are thinking. And I think that's true for both the readership as well as the membership. I want to give you an example of this, so we're concrete. This is from the latest issue of Spartacist, where you say, the defeat of Ukraine by Russia would be a humiliating blow for the US. It would signal weakness, have destabilizing consequences for Europe's political establishment, and place a question mark over NATO's future. We heard that quote before. It seems clear what you're saying, except literally two paragraphs later, you say, Russian workers must understand that the victory of their own government would, deal a, would not deal a fundamental blow to imperialism. Which one is it? It is a blow to imperialism, or it is not a blow to imperialism? Or maybe the blow is in the blow. Who knows? You just can't work out these days anymore. Perhaps you can explain if the blow to imperialism is a blow or not. I'm kind of struggling. Okay. But let's return to another question that is of utmost importance of the reborn Spartacist League. And that, of course, is the national question. Now, you know, we agree with that. The national question is important in the sense that we need to remove it from being a factor. And in so far, we need to have thoughts about it and address it. It plays certainly an aspect of the question in Ukraine, right? Because let's remember, the conflict started not just last year. The conflict started in 2014, in the aftermath of which the eastern populations of Ukraine, Crimea, Donbass, decided they did not want to be ruled by the fascist-infested Kiev regime. Yeah, yeah. They instead opted for the Russian Federation. Crimea held a referendum, overwhelmingly opted for Russian Federation. We believe that is their right. Zelensky and co think it is not their right and have been waging war on Donbass since that time. They have been shelling Donbass since that time. 30 seconds. We think they have a right to resist. We think it is a, the duty of revolutionaries to side with these people who, are, who try to struggle for self-determination against Kiev. With your understanding of national liberation, I would have expected you to ha have a side. And in this conflict currently, the national liberation of these countries can only come through a Russian victory. No other way can it be achieved. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, a supporter of side two, Spartacus League. You have to speak up. Yeah, the problem is the speaker. He should, he should be okay there. Yeah. Should be okay. I'll try. Let's try. Yeah, yeah. I'll just do it. I'd like to take a stab at answering Tom and the last two speakers. Okay, don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, go. And Tom gave it away in his presentation when you said, unfortunately, there is very little reality in the prospect of Russian work will rise up against their rules. said so where you that the war would end as a result. Where you put your money down with the Russian victory in Ukraine. That goes to the last speaker. Yes, there's a national question in the eastern part of Ukraine. But you know what? Russia's victory over Ukraine and the oppression of Ukrainian people does not worth the price of the East Russian 
of each Ukraine Russian population will engage in false freedom because it will unite Ukrainian workers behind imperialism even more firmly. That's what happens when you reject an independent proletarian perspective to advance the struggle against imperialism. And Barbara from the BT, okay, you want to cite to uh, black military shipments to Ukraine, to, to Gaza, fight against union leaders who are blocking that from happening here. The people who tie the British working class to the imperialists and the entirety of the left who will say the exact same thing as you said to support this thing. And you know what? It's for the same reason because they also say, well, the workers right now, they're, they're not uh, they're not socialists yet. So you can't fight for socialist leadership. You can't fight to overturn that co leadership in rich working class period every single time. It's all throughout the strike. So that's what links Tom's talk with you. It's like you had a little difference on this Russian imperialist or, or not. Um, and what so it's a very simple, simple thing here. Lenin had to fight the same damn fight in from 1914 to 1917, when he was denounced by a bunch of cows, as well as all the social children, saying, well, you're blowing soap bubbles, thinking that the workers will rise up on, on both sides of the barricades in that regard. You know, that was the only way to point a revolutionary way to pull forward. And all our corrections we've been at in the Spartan system, maybe the reason is that we can't see a uh, next year. It's about what? It's about what to do now. 30 seconds. Facing fearless words and actually just be a revolutionary. Okay, now I will recognize someone who's a speaker of neither side. Gentleman at the back. Hi, uh, my name's Stanley. Hold on, wait one second. Oh. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Stanley, and I'm a member of Claspus as an Um So, Vincent, you said that the central question uh, is that what is the strategy to defeat imperialism? Okay, sorry, just shout Stanley. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. You said that the central question is what strategy to, de to defeat imperialism, and we could reframe the question in that way. Um, and you gave some suggestion of what your answer to that would be in the... Speak up. <laughs> in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, you said that that would look like workers fraternizing and turning their guns on their respective ruling classes. And then I think this is something, there was a tension between the two of you here on this question of then what role does the working class in the US, the UK and Western Europe play? And you gave something of your picture of what that would be like. And the way you framed that was that we need to build an independent whole in the, work of the workers' movement that is opposed to imperialism and social chauvinist leadership. Um, the question is, Um, it's, it seems like there's a danger there of anti-imperialism becoming a sort of, they're becoming a kind of anti-imperialist pressure group within capitalist politics. And the question is, what is anti-imperialism without some kind of immediate prospect for revolution in Western Europe and the US? Because I think your position sort of tacitly assumes that that isn't immediately on the table. Okay. All right, back to BT. And that right there. The people at the back will need it to hear you. Okay. Um, I think it's a good thing, we think it's a good thing that the Spartacist tendency is trying to grapple and come to grips with its history. Um, that's a start, and we don't actually agree with most of the conclusions you've drawn from looking at your history, but I think it's a good thing. But one of the things I think that's really wrong is placing it in the 1990s with the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think, as Tom mentioned in his uh, talk, you have to go back to the 1970s at the end of the 
anti-war movement, the end of the sort of new left, when things sort of became frozen somewhat in the North America. And the Spartacus League uh, started a number of apolitical fights internally, the clone fight, the smashing of Liz Gordon for criticizing an article on Roman Polanski that was co-authored by James Robertson, and the worst one, the worst, at the travesty of the 1979 Colchester Conference that saw Bill Logan expelled and declared to be unfit for the workers' movement. I worked under Bill and Adair at the, their section, uh, actually, when I joined in 1974, when I joined in Canada, was regarded as a model section of the Spartacist tendency. It was upheld. It was something to emulate. Suddenly, Bill is here. They have the biggest recruitment from the WSL to the Spartacist tendency, the biggest recruitment they ever had. And suddenly, and then Bill was in charge of it, Bill becomes a threat. And so, to, you know, he was supposed to just quit. They, they tried to push him out, and he wouldn't. So they had a conference, and they had all these lurid details, all this crap. They wrote, the Spartacist Tennessee wrote two, uh, two published two documents on it. We've done a small synopsis of the key ones. If you read it, it is obvious that the leadership of the Spartacist League lied through their teeth. They knew exactly what was going on. There's correspondence going back and forth. It was it just entirely a frame-up trial on the order of something the Stalinists do. And unfortunately, this kind of internal life, this kind of lying, when you start lying about your political opponents, when you start accusing people of all kinds of slanders and smears, that has an external expression. And the Spartacist League, unfortunately, acted that way to a lot of its political opponents on the left here and in North America and everywhere else. Seconds. And it really hurt their reputation. I hope that people in the Spartacist tendency and around them can go back and read that the documents and retract, retract the kind of the, the, the arguments they made at that time. Okay. Uh, supporter of the Spartacist League, uh, the front line. Thank you. Um, there's a reason in re reviewing our, the history of our tendency that we chose 19, the, the period from 1990, and that's because the defining event of this uh, of this period was counter-revolution in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and there was one tendency on the planet which stood up and proved to be revolutionary in that instance, and that was the Spartacist tendency. And what made it revolutionary, our intervention, was not that we mobilized all our resources, although we did, and not that we were a huge factor, although we were. It's because we were, and we put forward an independent path for the proletariat in East Germany, in the political revolution, against counter-revolution, against capitalist reunification of Germany, and in opposition to the crumbling Stalinist bureaucracy, which was defecting. That's why we start there. Now, all of the references to our history coming from the BT and the IBT is for one simple reason, to justify their own rotten positions and some of our own positions that we have junked that they now want to uphold. So it's very striking how much of our recent positions that you've gone to such lengths to avoid. For example, um, there's been nothing on, uh, there's been mention of 1967 war, 1948 war. We have three leaflets on the war of Israel against Palestine that we've intervened with, which has for the first time put forward really a program for the Israeli working class to take up as a strategic question the liberation of Palestine. This is not, so, uh, you know, there's references to our old positions on the national question that you want to uphold. How about take on that question and answer it? That's what we're putting forward for today. It's one thing to say, you can carry a sign in one of those mass demonstrations for a binational worker state. It is absolutely meaningless if you do not take on what are the obstacles to achieving any kind of a worker state in the region, such as the pro-imperialist labor bureaucracy and labor party in Britain, 
The red line that is drawn from the White House to number 10 Downing Street to the to the trade union movement in this country to all of the socialists left. I'll tell you, if any of your positions, if you take any one of your positions and put forward what the working class needs to do in order to achieve it, you will have to confront the 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 syphilitic chain that links the working class to the bourgeoisie in this country. Thanks. And that is what you have not done. OK, Jerry. All right. OK, Jerry Downing. Can you speak up for us, please? All right. I'll do my best. Thank you. Jerry Downing from Socialist Fight. I think there's on the question of Trotskyism, I think there's there's one thing that's been totally missing from this conversation up to now, and that's the question of transitional demands. Nobody has mentioned transitional demands and what is their role in this situation. Of course, transitional demands change according to the consciousness of the working class. If you're on the eve of revolution, your transitional demands are your demands are for the overthrow of the capitalist state for the insurrection. However, if that is not the case and the consciousness of the working class is somewhat lower and hasn't yet reached that, you're making other demands. Now, if we remember way back in 1935, Italy invaded Abyssinia. And in the invasion of Abyssinia, Trotsky was definitely for the defeat of it, of Italy by the Negus, by Haile Selassie, even though that was a semi-slave, slave-owning society. He was definitely for the defeat of imperialism. In 1936, when Japan invaded China again, he was for the anti-imperialist United Front to defeat Japan in collaboration with the Kuomintang. And famously, in 1938, when he said that if the UK were to invade Brazil, he was for the victory of semi-fascist Brazil, the Negus government, the Vargas government of semi-fascist Brazil against the USA and against the UK, against Britain, because he said, well, that defeat would strengthen the anti-imperialism in the Brazilian working class. But more importantly, it would kill or deal a big blow to the chauvinism in the British working class. And for that, I go with the Bolshevik tendency position on that. I come from a group called the Workers' Revolutionary Party, who had a catastrophic position that the revolution was just 18 months away. It was just around the corner. You have to put forward your revolutionary seconds right now, immediately. Right in the last 30 seconds, there's a few things that were missing as well. In 1977, there was the thesis on Ireland, which put forward the interpenetrated people theory. Now, the interpenetrated people's theory went on to the war in Israel, Japan, the Nakba, where you took a dual defeatist position, a slanderous dual defeatist position. Sorry, Jerry, you're out of time, but thanks for raising that. OK, we're back to the start. Bolshevik tendency. So I read with great interest the recent correspondence between Jan Norton of the Internationalist Group and your comrade Burrell. And I assume based on the fact and by virtue of the fact that we're in this room having a comradely debate that the Spartacus League of today would repudiate or recognize at least that that it was the worst sort of cynical travesty to slanderously insinuate that the BT had connections to Cointelpro or the Mossad. Just as you now recognize it as unprincipled, the expulsion of the founding cadre of the IG. So I agree with comrade Norton that a more specific accounting is required if the intent is not merely to make do with a quick confession, but to seriously evaluate the meaning and lessons of events involving the Spartacus League's degeneration. However, I also found comrade Norton's insistence 
highly ironic since prior to joining the BT, I engaged in extensive discussions and correspondence. This was back in 1997 with the IG, and they were wholly opposed to what they termed a futile hunt for the original sin of Spartacism. I think to his credit, Comrade Perot has been willing to criticize James Robertson, something that I found Norton completely unwilling to do, even when I pointed out how parallel his account of the IG comrade's expulsion in the 1990s was to the ET's descriptions of the internal life of BSL back in the early 1980s. In fact, in my discussions with Norton, he was unwilling to grapple with the regime question as any sort of politically substantive question, neither the abuse of comrades nor the zigzags from the Stalin affiliate Yuri Andropov Brigade to the thoroughly liberal offer to defend the Democratic National Convention or anything in which he could be implied to have been complicit, including that awful Workers Vanguard headline to save the Marines in Lebanon, which occurred while he was the editor of Workers Vanguard, which he's never been willing to repudiate in writing. I assume today, with the emphasis on the main enemies imperialism, that the SL would want to distance itself from that position correctly. But, you know, if you look at that, that clearly has, it was a predecessor for the Haiti position, which you do recognize as having been incorrect. One of the aspects of Norton's analysis, of course, is that he has wanted to trace everything to the collapse of the USSR and the deformed worker states in Eastern Europe, which is now mirrored in your analysis in Spartacus. But that's simply not correct. The degeneration of the SL occurred long before 1991. So a regrouping discussion is important, but not to throw out the baby in the bathwater. Thank you. We're now going to recognize someone from the Spartacus League. Gabriel. So it's interesting to look at the both BTs, BT and IBT, struggle a little bit with understanding our position. Because, after all, the U.S. is centrally involved in the war. Russia is not imperialist, yet we say we don't say support to Russia. How does that make sense? Well, it makes sense because we've got a fundamental different starting point from both BTs, which is to advance the struggle for revolution. And you must answer this question. How does your position advance the struggle for revolution? And actually, your speaker, Tom Riley, really gave the game away by saying it is not likely that a revolutionary situation will come out of this. So let's look at which one, you know, basically, let's look at which is the best option from what we've got. But this whole starting point for Marxism is that it's not just A or B, you know, but there's the working class as an active factor in the world. And that is what guides our whole approach to the world. Now, in terms of looking back, you know, we ourselves have looked back very carefully in terms of our history of our tendency. But again, what is guiding looking back to the history of our tendency? We are interested in doing it insofar as it helps guide the struggle for today. And the decisive question, if you look at the world, if you look at it from a bit of a stand, why did I join the Spartacus League? I joined the Spartacus League based on its record on the Russian question, on the decisive event of that epoch, the counter-revolution, the ICL was at its post. And we have criticism. There certainly were problems. But that is the decisive question. And any revision or discussion about what the past has to be to guide the future struggles. Now, just a more general point. Even in cases, and some of the comments already spoke to this, even in the cases where the working class does have a side objectively with one, the starting point isn't just, you know, is there a side that benefits the working class or not? There's always, it's always the question of how do you advance revolution? The question of China. Okay, Trotsky was definitely for the defense of China against Japan. But his perspective wasn't just, oh, we have a side with China. No, it was a revolutionary perspective to advance revolution. And that is absent from your position. On the national question. Well, I can answer very clearly. We defend the democratic rights of the Russian minorities. We defend the rights of Crimea to be Russia. But what you guys, but we also defend the rights of the Ukrainians to decide. And that you deny. 
because it's all subordinated. But the only way you're going to solve the national question in this context is with the with the proletarian revolution, not by the victory of Russia. The victory of Russia will not solve the national question. It will only keep the cycle going. Thank you. OK, we we'll now recognize someone from support of neither organization, the woman at the back there. Hello. Lucy. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Lucy. Um, Speak I'm, up. I'm from Platypus. Um, uh, I wanted to just draw out a, a few of the bits of the conversation that have already been happening. One is to come back to this question of method and reality, and two is to um, try to better understand the two speakers' uh, perspective on imperialism, the defining imperialism as a question. Um, my understanding of uh, uh, Lenin's take on imperialism, the reality he's dealing with, uh, is yes, uh, at least World War One, but also uh, the mass growth and development of a working class movement for socialism. And he's um, making that intervention uh, there, the fight against social chauvinists, as people have been saying, is, is in the context of a mass working class movement. Um, and uh, he is critiquing uh, both. Uh, fellow Marxist Milfording and also uh, liberal like Hobson uh, to uh, try to better articulate what what that historical moment, uh, what, what the possibilities are in that historical moment. And that uh, imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism, as he describes it, is um, uh, a moment of, of, of crisis and of the potential for socialism. Uh, that, that being the kind of necessary aspect of, of how he's understanding imperialism is that moment is, is that it's 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 overripe for for a socialist revolution and um, and that so socialism feels imminently possible in that moment uh, materially um, due to forces on the ground. So I want to understand uh, better from both speakers uh, how how you apply. Uh, your perspective on imperialism today in the absence of a mass working class movement for socialism. And I guess to follow up on uh, 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 what my comrade behind me was, was saying, uh, there seemed to be some acknowledgement from the speakers that that wasn't Im imminently possible, but I, I, it's still not quite clear to me uh, what, what that means. Okay, thank you. Back to the first side, supporter of the BT. Yes. Have you got the microphone? Uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> you are Mr. Microphone. I am. So I Check. anyway, so um so the the question of counterposing some kind of abstract revolutionary orientation to the working class versus taking a position in a military conflict is a false one. I mean, if we look at how we got to this place, right, it was a series of provocations by NATO imperialism against Russia. Yes? First, in, you know, uh, former Warsaw countries all signed up for NATO. Number two, $5 billion for the made on coup, which not a word from sparsely today on to change a corrupt but democratically elected government in Ukraine into basically a Galician nationalist government which sought civil war against the East. And they, they wanted to be integrated into the, into the NATO machine, training, equipment. This was preparation for war, right? So, um, so what's the third uh, event that comes out of this? There, you know, there was attempts at peace, um, the, the two Minsk Accords, which tried to establish some autonomy for the eastern provinces. Like even the even the German chancellor, former German chancellor, has admitted that we were just buying time, you know, to build up the Ukrainian military forces under NATO so we can go after Russia. Like, I mean, you know, so I think everybody in this room should agree with the statement that while the Russian special military operation was um, uh, tactically 
aggressive, it was fundamentally defensist. I mean, this is not, this should be like, this should be of no surprise to anybody. So what is in the interests of the workers? Like sometimes a military defeat does generate political upheaval. Like look at the, look at the military junta in Argentina, which went on an adventurous war to conquer an island filled with sheep herders to establish, you know, to brandish up the, the authority of the regime. Yes, they faced British, they faced the British military. They were defeated. What happened immediately after that? They were overthrown by a popular uprising. That's a, that's a historical fact. Okay. Now it's interesting that the Spartacus League has changed their position on that, but the original Spartacus League position on that was quite correct in its analysis and, and in the facts of the, on the ground. So, you know, I, I, I think that this artificial dichotomy of orientation to the working class versus strategic understanding. Okay. Thank you. It's a false one. Okay. So the Spartacus League. So anyone, people can speak again for a second time if they wish. Okay. Yes. Back at the front. Okay. Uh, I want to respond to just a couple of questions that have been raised because for all the complaints that you make about us having slandered your organization, you're actually the ones that are bringing up things that happened 40 or 50 years ago. So I want to ask the question here, what is the purpose of bringing up Bill, what Bill Logan did 50 years ago, which we actually, it seems we actually agree that he was guilty of what he did at the time. The only dispute is who knew or who didn't know. How does this, how does any of this help to arm, help, help to arm the working class for today's struggles? I don't see any way, shape or form in which this is useful. Mm. Um, it's about arming you for today's struggle. Well, hold on, hold on. It's, it's my speaking time. So, uh, so honestly, mm. I want to ask, I think the discussion shows clearly that we have here two different types of organization. Our organization, after the work that we've done in the last three years, sets as its goal mm. to be an active factor of intervention in the workers' movement to fight for the politics that we have put forward here on Ukraine. So, for example, it's not just words out of Vincent's mouth. We have fought for this in the, you know, in the trade union movement, in the working class. Like we actually believe that it is possible and that we should be a revolutionary factor. My second point is, and this goes for both the Bolshevik tendency and Platypus, you seem to, to have unity on the question that there is nothing that the working class can do today at all. But the thing is, if you're a revolutionary, it is your task to actually set forth and lead the working class in what needs to be done next. So, for example, during the strike movement last year in this country, at every stage of the strike movement, we put forward what does the working class need to do next in order to win this strike? Because it's in the interests of, of the British working class to win these strikes, and it's in the interest of furthering the struggle for workers' revolution that these strikes be won. And at each stage, we put forward what tactics are necessary. We're doing the same thing today over the Gaza war. We're putting forward what is it that workers need to fight for in Palestine, in Israel, and in Britain in order to defeat the Zionist state. And that's, and that's infinitely more important than having a debate over the 1948 war, which we will go back and review, but really where we start from is what is your program today? What are you fighting seconds. for? Okay. Uh, now I'm going to recognize the speaker of neither side, supporter of neither side, the gentleman in the yellow shirt there. My name is Alec Gilchrist. Um, I think that there's a problem with both sides of this debate, and it's a very fundamental one. But the failure to understand that the situation we're in today most closely resembles the early phases of World War I. And the reason for that is that China is an imperialist country, it is a capitalist country, 
and Russia is a an, a, attempting to restore its imperial position. It occupies a position analogous to Japan in 1895 to 1910. The definition of an imperialist country is not achieved by totting up uh, the figures for export or import of capital. If we'd used that method, if Lenin had used that method in the First World War, then he would have drawn the conclusion that Russia wasn't really a, 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 an imperialist country. And he took exactly the opposite attitude because he understood the significance of Russia as a great industrial power and an ally of the countries that invested in it, um, Britain and France, and the, the, the role that it was seeking to play um, as uh, to become one of the, uh, the, you know, the, the first rank, if you like. The same thing, um, you know, this question of, of Japan is, uh, is relevant because we're also, uh, the, 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 with Russia today, the, the position of Russia is being fought over. It's a dynamic question. It's not just a, it's not a question of static analysis. And it's not exhausted by whether or not bombs are, are dropping on the Russian territory. This war being fought in Ukraine is a proxy war. A proxy war means that it's exactly the same issues are being fought over, but they are being fought displaced in terms of the geography, and they are being fought indirectly in terms of the forces that are, that are being deployed, particularly on the NATO side because of the use of Ukraine. But it is a war between two imperialist powers, one challenging, one, in, one dominant, one with a block which is being formed between China and Russia, the other with a block which is fragile and which is actually traces into imperialist uh, fissures and rivalries, particularly with respect to, to France and Germany. If, that, that is a very fundamental... 30 seconds. Thank you. This is a very fundamental difference. The consequence of that analysis is certainly that with respect to Ukraine and, and, and Russia, there is no reason for the working class to have a side. No more than there was a reason for the working class to have a side between Austria and, uh, and, 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 and Russia, let's say, over the question of, of, uh, of Serbia. Thank you. Can leave it there. Okay, we're back to the start. So, BT, Roxanne. This will probably be the last round. Hi, I'm, I'm Roxanne. I'm a supporter of the Bolshevik tendency. So, yeah, we think the SL is wrong in failing to draw the logical conclusions from its own observations that Ukraine is being tragically used as a proxy war of the US and NATO to get at Russia and China. And, of course, being able to assess different class forces and intervene in, in an event whilst it's actually happening is one of our hardest and most important jobs as revolutionaries. As Julie and others have said, and Gabriel made the point, I agree, Gabriel, that looking at the past helps to guide the future. So that's why I want to mention another historical example, one of the most important for the Spartacist League, 1979, where we were unique on the Iranian revolution. There's the revolution word for you. But there, we didn't have a side. The struggle in Iran, unlike that in Ukraine um, today, was a domestic revolt by Khomeini and his followers against the Shah's regime. But unlike in Ukraine, where massive amounts of money, weapons, intelligence, personnel, etc., are shared in a proxy war, it wasn't actually decisive at that time um, with US involvement. But now you've thrown out this position, like so many others, one of the most important contributions of the SL historically. In your latest Spartacist number 68, you express outrage that the SL dared to tell the truth about Khomeini at the time, but you admit how reactionary it was. In Iran, there was potential for a fully-fledged workers' revolution, but there was no revolutionary leadership. There was not an homogenous mass following Khomeini either. Those workers, like the three million oil workers often operating in dual power situations during and after the, the February insurrection, were told to go back to work during their strikes by Khomeini. They resisted when they could, but the cowardly and confused left said, let's follow the anti-imperialist leader. They failed to grasp the deadly danger at the time, or didn't want to. And then after not too long, it was too late. The left was decapitated, women's rights were eradicated, etc. The workers needed to consciously struggle against Khomeini as an independent political force, something that you've really emphasised today. But instead, they were politically and physically disarmed by the treacherous left who disorientated those they could have won over 
They could have won those oil workers, but they reinforced the illusions of the Islamic fundamentalist leadership rather than challenging them and telling the truth about what Khomeini was. And you condone that in Sparta 68. Class collaborationism masked as so-called anti-imperialism always ends in bloodshed and defeat, which is why I'm bringing up this question, because it's not abstract. We look at history to inform today. We know from history that it always happens. Participating in a movement is not enough. 30 seconds. The program is important. Now, the, the Iranian USEC, the HKS, recognized this retrospectively in 1983 in a very extensive document, as some others did. But it's easier to look back at the fact. The SL got it right at the time, but now you, comrades, SL of 2023, even after the events unfolded exactly as the SL said they would, you still junk this important contribution. So I urge you to reassess that. Okay, thanks. That's time. Uh, S. Sparta's League, anyone who hasn't spoken before? No, okay, so back to you. All right, um, you're really good. I'll respond to this point on the Iranian Revolution, because I actually think it's much more interesting than a lot of the other points that were made by the comrades. Um, so I, I think, uh, so we, we stayed very, relatively limited in our Spartacists in terms of the, the Iran, Iranian Revolution. Let's be clear, what we are repudiating is not that the left totally betrayed by, by supporting the mullahs. That is absolutely not what we are putting in question. The left played an absolutely criminal role in the Iranian Revolution, and uh, it was absolutely correct to denounce this. The, what was the problem with the Spartacist intervention in Iran? Is that was totally denying that actually imperialism was playing a key role. The fight the, that the Shah was seen as the agent of the imperialists in Iran, and that uh, one of the important factors bringing the masses into action was the struggle against imperialism. So what was necessary to forge an independent road? It was necessary to understand this, so to be able to drive a wedge between the mullahs and the sentiment in the population. But we did not say a word like practically no word about this question. You know, um, Khomeini got a lot of his anti-imperialist credentials by denouncing the U.S. and the, the Shah, and we totally denied that. And instead, we just kind of equate, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the reaction in, the, in, in Iran and reaction in imperialist countries. But it was different. There was different animating forces that were driving the masses. And, and you had to understand this, what were the forces driving the masses in action to be able to actually effectively break the hold of the mullahs. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentleman at the back there, do you want to stand up and shout? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks very much. Um, can everyone hear me? A bit louder. Can, can, can everyone hear me? So um, I was interested, um, I'm back as well, by the way. So um, I was interested in what Tom had to say about uh, program determining theory. Um, and I'd be interested to hear kind of what, what people make of that. I mean, it, specifically, it's, it's a line from, from Jim Robertson. Um, I'm reminded of another Robertson line about the, um, the, uh, the first four congresses of the Comintern um, kind of seeming to look down on us in the present, like as if from a mountain. And Robertson also says um, that the ability to understand the world and the ability to change it are uh, intertwined inextricably. And... You know, I think it relates to this question of, um, on the one hand, method and practice, um, or kind of theory and practice, or, you know, program and theory, the, the relationship between those. Um, but I'm, I'm also not convinced that, you know, you, you can say that, um, okay, we need to, you know, we need to um, think about the history in terms of how it, um, you know, determines our... Uh, <laughs> you know, concrete involvement in struggles right now and, and how it kind of aids the class struggle right now. You can say that, but that can still be a kind of abstract proposition, right? If you can say, I mean, I'm, I'm used to going to lab phone meetings where people say, okay, we've, we've, we've talked enough, we need to kind of get out there now. But at the end of the day, it's still everyone talking to each other, right? It's, it remains a kind of, it remains a kind of abstract polemical point. Um, so I, I, I just want to raise that, that question of, um, a, the relationship between the program and uh, the, the movement or the, you know, intervening in the movement, like, what, what does that mean? Um, but also, you know, in, in Plata, there's a kind of um, 
uh, our kind of argument is that that has implications for the issue of revolutionary continuity. Everyone in this room seems to be making uh, a claim of some sort towards revolutionary continuity and you know upholding that revolutionary continuity, whether it's in the form of a program uh, or orientation towards uh, the working class or some kind of combination of the two. Our argument would be that um, actually this this continuity has been broken. Uh, in a kind of fundamental way, and that the the categories of imperialism, or or uh, you know, uh, at least in the the kind of Lenin understanding, might not quite fit the existing context. So I I I want to kind of raise that as just a, something you know, seeing we're getting near the end, as as something to kind of um, consider, like how how deep does the problem go, and what kind of problem is it? That's it. Okay. In the interest of not inadvertently missing someone and appearing to prejudice towards Plato's members. I'm just going to recognise the gentleman in the blue jacket at the back who is a supporter of neither side yep. as the last speaker. Hi, my name's Chris Taylor. I was in the Spartacist League from 1976 to 1981. Uh, and I just a warning to the comrades from the Spartacist League. You ignore your history at your peril. And I see, I sense here all kinds of apisotypes uh, uh, that will take you uh, long, a long way from any kind of revolutionary path. Uh, you, have, you have to understand your history because that's the only way that you have a chance of actually building the basis of a revolutionary party. And that's what we're all interested in. How do you build a revolutionary party? And particularly when uh, we are, we, we, we represent very little now. Trotskyism has, for, I won't go into too much detail, but historic defeats over and over again, including physical liquidations across the world and a loss of all our best leaders, Trotsky, but many others. And the important thing, I think, is that what the Spartacist League did in the end was it succumbed to political agoraphobia. It stopped intervening in the workers' movement. It actually wound up all its trade union fractions. Uh, it became impossible for someone like me, who was a trade union activist, to actually fight for the transitional program and know that I had the support of my comrades. Uh, in fact, in the end, I was more scared of them than I was of the bosses. That's the reality. Um, and if you don't look at that stuff and understand what happened there, you are in grave danger of repeating it. And I just get the sense, I get the sense here that, that, that you have a grave danger of, of, of basically indulging in what we used to call fake mass work. And just be careful, without revolutionary theory, you cannot have revolutionary practice without understanding the history of your organization and where it started to go wrong. You don't stand a chance. And that wasn't in 1990 with the downfall of the Soviet Union. Uh, that, seconds. OK, that's it. That's all I have to say. Learn from history. Ooh, all right. <laughs> um, <coughs> I'll just get the history out of the way. There was a lot of comment throughout the discussion. But what I find from the discussion so far, there was there was a few good points and a few good interventions, and I'll, and I'll get to them. But mainly, in general, what I found were people stirring history from stuff that happened 45, 50 years ago. Without, we don't really understand what how, what is it about? What, what is the point? What is the purpose? Here's the thing. like A lot of the VT are really frustrated because because, uh, uh, I don't know, they were frustrated in their ego in the early 80s, and they like to bring this up, and, and they like to bring this stuff. Now, I'm not saying everything was perfect, and we can review some of this stuff, but I would really like to hammer, comrades, like, first of all, we will look at our past only to the extent that it helps us fight for revolution. And if you're not happy with that, well, I'm sorry, like, you're not, you shouldn't be in the revolutionary movement. Because that's the whole bloody point. And the second thing is like, we can look more at our past. I'm, I'm really for it. But some people said, oh, you haven't done a full account. You haven't done a full account. Well, you have to make a case for that as to why revolutionary action today demands a full account of this. 
But the only thing is like, oh, yeah, you did bad stuff in the late 70s, and, and, and that's wrong, you know? And then a few limited position about, like, Lebanon in 1983 in a headline. Like, you know what's the problem with that Lebanon article? It doesn't have a perspective to liberate the Lebanon masses or the Palestinian masses. It's not permanent revolution, that article. It's not the headline of whether it's alive or not, you know? That's not qualitative. That's not qualitative, you know? So the point about history and our past, we're an, we're an organization that goes back 60 years, and I and I know a lot about the history of our organization, and I'm very critical of it, and I think one of the things actually that we cannot accuse of is not to be critical of our past, if you've read some of this stuff. And you know, we've done a big a, a big account since the, ni since the 90s, which, which is called this, and which is called a program for the fourth international. That is our account, and that it, it explains that since counter-revolution, liberalism became the dominant ideology, and all the left capitulated to it, and therefore what's needed is to build a Marxist bull against liberalism. And I'm sorry, our organization wasn't great in the 90s and 2000s, and we are very critical of it too, but the BT did the same thing, and the entire left did the same thing. So the question is, where do we go now, you know, and we haven't heard much about this from comments from the BT, you know, it's it, it's not revolutionary work to raise. Well, what about that headline in 83? Or what about that? But that, that's not how you conceive of revolutionary Marxist work, you know. Same thing with geopolitics. Hans Gabriel, you raised like geopolitical like question about Crimea. I think some some people responded to you, but like. How about motivating why your position is important for revolution? Still, no BT has been able to motivate as to why supporting Russia advanced socialism. Now, there's been a few, there's been a few attempts at getting close to that, and I will respond to it. I think it's the person with the mic, I think, got closer. So he made an argument as to like, well, you know, when there is a, a, a defeat of the imperialists, then, you know, it creates certain situation and instability, et cetera, et cetera, you know? Well, the first of all, in Ukraine, it would be the Ukrainian army that will be defeated. And it will be, I'm not saying there's a whole broader context, but yeah, but it will be the Ukrainian army and Ukraine that will be conquered, nationally oppressed, for, for a starter. And second, the, the point about, it, it is true in general that, that, that reverse of policy can create instability, but it, it, it's not a guarantee of a revolutionary situation at all. So, for example, there's been a lot of talk about blows, you know. This war could create a blow to NATO or this or that, you know. It, it, w the reason why the BT thinks there's a contradiction between us recognizing this and not siding with Russia is because you don't view the, the intervention of Marxists as pushing revolution. Set it like a, it's like an objectivist geopolitical thing. So let's say, let's take NATO, for example. It is true that this war poses its existence. The most likely outcome in terms of NATO breaking apart is Germany splitting its connection with the United States and siding with Russia in creating a counterpost bloc to the U.S. That would break up NATO. That would be a blow to the United States. But it would most likely mean World War III. So the point is not a blow or a good, you know. You mentioned Iran. The taking over of power of the mullah was a blow to U.S. imperialism and a disaster for the working class. Take Afghanistan also, you know. Uh, at that time, we, you know, we had a sighting, obviously, and we we're very happy that the U.S. is out of Afghanistan. Of course, of course. It, but and that was a blow to the U.S. But the position of the working class has not so much been strengthened by it, in a sense. And the Afghani masses have the Taliban. So, like, to just speak of blows and maybe there'll be instability is not enough. It's not Marxist, you know. And like, here's the thing about your position for Russia. Your position for Russia fuels Russian nationalism, drive the Ukrainian into the arms of the nationalists. And your organization refuses to fight against the social chauvinists and the pro-imperialist leaders of the workers' movement. So when that instability comes, there needs to be a party to actually fight, but your entire position militates against that. There won't be a party if we follow your position. So we've talked of like, people say mass fake. Actually, let's take a step back here. There is a connection between what Platypus is saying and what you mentioned in your, in your, in your presentation. And it's the fact that, well, revolution seems very far right now. So we will take some other position that is not revolution. Now we are not, of course we know that revolution is not right around the corner. You know, it's, of course we know that it's not for tomorrow morning. And, you know, I would like to point 
you had a text called the, the Collapse of the Second International by Lenin, which he dealt exactly with that same argument. Everybody was like, Lenin is talking out of his head about revolution, and he responded very simply. The point is not whether revolution is right for tomorrow morning or not. The point is the duty of socialists to take a revolutionary stand and to fight for this, whatever the circumstances. So people are like, oh, we're doing mass work, you know, by the way, transitional demands, you know, for stop arms shipments to Ukraine, throw the Zionists out of the labor and TUC. These are the sorts of demands we're trying to push in the workers' movement. We're trying to drive that wedge between the leaders of the, tra of the trade union and the labor party and the base of the, of the party, uh, the base of the, of the trade unions. That is revolutionary work. That is advancing revolution. We're not, we're not saying it will have a mass audience right away, but fighting for a revolutionary position now is how you deal with a situation where there's not a revolution immediately, forging cadre for such work. But you can only forge revolutionary cadre by putting forward a revolutionary perspective, you know? You can only build revolutionary party by, 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 by saying, here's what the working class should fight for and fighting for it. Not by saying, well, revolution is out of the agenda, so we'll find another path. That is the content of saying, well, we would all like a Ukrainian uprising, but we won't fight for it. Because right now it seems too remote. Well, the day it will happen, you will see that latching to the Russian bourgeoisie for some sort of push against imperialism will have undermined the effort of building a revolutionary tendency in Ukraine. Um, the national question in Ukraine, somebody mentioned it. The, but I, I think the point is, like, it's quite simple in a sense. Of course, we are against the, the oppression of the Russian minorities. And of course, we are for the end of that oppression. And you say, well, the only way to do this is through a Russian victory. But, like, the Russian victory oppresses the Ukrainians, it oppresses the Ukrainian minorities. Don't say no. They're concrete the country. Like so, like okay, yeah, maybe that will end the oppression of the Russians, but it will create the oppression of the Ukrainians. And no one, by the way, no, no BT here has so far raised this. Like I'm all for liberating the the Russian minority and fighting for that. But but you know the the, the national rights of Ukrainians uh, uh, are really important in a revolutionary position. But that's what your position is blinded for by the by this this sentence, which has nothing to do with Marxism, about how uh, uh, Russia has a right to severe Ukraine's uh, tie to NATO or something. Well, well, why don't you call for Russia to invade Poland or the Baltic state to cut the NATO uh, connection? Like that is the logic. You see, you're not. Of course, we are against Ukraine being part of NATO, and of course, we're against NATO everywhere. But you have to to build a revolutionary movement in these countries against imperialism, not support the foreign invaders. You know, there's one thing Polish people or Ukrainian will never want is, is to be invaded by Russia. Like, for fuck's sake, like, this is what the, the position that you're, you're taking is understood by these people. Um, <clears throat> just on the character of the war, like, Anne Gabriel or, or, or something, the, I do not deny that and the American imperialists would love to break up Russia. And that is obvious. They would love to have counter, you know, if you're an American imperialist, you know, counter revolution in China, Russia is broken up. And, you know, of course they have their, 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 their dream world, but you're taking these quotes really to mean that this is what, that's not what is being posed at the moment. Like, let's be real here. The only country that is being broken up is Ukraine. The Ukrainian army is not gonna is not gonna make its way to Moscow. Like the, the Germans couldn't do it, the Ukrainian army will certainly not do it. You know. But, so the question that's posed with the war is about the control of Ukraine. Of course, there are broader challenges, and we recognize it. And again, you think there's a contradiction? Of course, yeah, it, it is a proxy war. You know. But our attitude, the attitude of revolutionary of the Bolsheviks, must be first and foremost determined as to. What advances and further the class struggle? What advances the fight for revolution? That must be our approach, not just like, oh my God, the imperialists really want to destroy Russia, and now they're helping somebody that is fighting Russia, so therefore necessarily we must we, we must just you know support that other side. That's not a Marxist attitude, the thing. And the IBT, and once again, and I'll finish on this. There, like you know, we can talk about Palestine and all this stuff, but you haven't. 
fought against the trade union leaders of this country. They're the one blocking armed shipments. Why there's no working class action against imperialism? It's because of them. It's because of the leaders of the TTO. Well, where is your article about it? Why, why was it not in the presentation? Why, why, do, why do you have placards that don't talk about that? See, that's the difference between analysis, geopolitical, and Marxist work. We fight in the working class against the, the social shonik, against these traitors, and we try to expose them. This is not facts, fa fake mass work. This is the task. This is what Leninists do. Okay. Um, well, Congress is in practical activity. Six weeks ago, there was the United Front demonstration in Toronto, the first opposition to the Ukraine war. Ukraine is extremely, uh, there's an extremely powerful fascistic Ukrainian organization in Canada. The deputy prime minister is one of the leaders of it. Uh, there's an enormous amount of pressure, and and uh, been, there was very little resistance. And five, six weeks ago, we had a united front. Five different organizations, all claiming to be Marxist, came together. We were one of them. One of them, Marxist claimed organizations that wouldn't participate, was guess what? Your section. And why wouldn't they? Well, because the main slogan was end NATO's proxy war in Ukraine. And it wasn't a proxy war, the comrades thought. I, now I hear it is a proxy war. Your organization is in very deep trouble, that's clear. You really don't know where you're going, and you don't seem to want to be, if you're not interested in where you came from, how you ended up like this. The Spartacus League is precious to us. But the Spartacus League of the 1960s and 70s that correctly <clears throat> grappled with questions which no other tendency addressed properly. The RT began because it alone in the world understood what was going on in Cuba. And it then successfully addressed it and didn't get everything right, but it successfully addressed all the major issues that came afterwards through the 70s, etc. And there were some very important issues. And we're saying to you now, what about the Mideast Wars? Are you for the Arab Revolution like the Pavloids were, like the Heliites were? Do you believe that the Arab national bourgeoisies are going to constitute an alternative to the revolutionary working class that's going to solve the problems of, you know, or at least it's going to address the national oppression of Palestinians, et cetera? And you're saying you don't really know. And a comrade here says, he responds, well, the article in 1948, which I write, I didn't raise the art one article written by Y. Rad. In, in Workers' Vanguard number 21, I raised the question of the political position the Spartacus League had taken, which we have defended at great length, by the way. If you want to see what we have to say, read our Trotsky's bullet number three uh, against the sophisticated left tabloids of workers' power, where we defended the historic Spartacus question, uh, position on all those questions. Newcomers, I guess, don't know. But we're not talking about why Red's article. We're talking about the position do we support the Arab bourgeois in 48, 67, 73? You're obviously flirting with saying yes. Then you become cowboys. Um, you're you're partway there, unfortunately. And we're trying to rescue you. Do the best you can. Uh, this United Front that we had drew 100 people on our side. We drew 60 or 70 on their side, too. And we uh, had to fend off problems coming from them. We were actively involved in the world. We're going to be actively involved with the same coalition, with the same demand in front of the Ontario Federation of Labor, a thousand delegates from every part of the province in two weeks. And as far as I know, now probably, maybe, get on the phone or send them a text and maybe they will join our efforts. Uh, but don't talk to us about you're doing real work. Yeah, you may produce a few extra leaflets. Good. Good on you. But you know what real work is? Real work is sinking roots into the trade unions, is building a following in key sectors of the proletariat. And the Spartacus League had that in the 1980s, and that was destroyed. Yes. That was destroyed yes. as a result of the internal cancer, which was manifested very dramatically in the Logan thing. And the reason I'll study the Logan is that you can read both sides and you can see. And this was a leadership had gone profoundly off the rails. This is a leadership where if the leader had, a, had written an article and if, if the one of the members of the political bureau said that she thought one line in that article was unbalanced, the group should split. 
What was that? And she was she should be slapped around. What was that? Pulaski. That's not healthy. You can't get to a revolution with it when an organization operates on that basis. And you say, oh, don't tell me about this stuff. It's all 40 years ago. It's before I was born. I don't care about it. You don't care about it, but it's going to care about you. And it and you know what? We've got a tradition and we can we can go back and we can say, was it wrong? Where we wrong? I don't think we were wrong in 73. I don't think we were wrong in 67 or 48. Um, but, you know, but we can talk about it. I also don't think we were wrong in 83. We were wrong to say that it was a good thing. The U.S. Marines got blown in Lebanon and the French paratroopers. You guys said, well, it's a long time ago. It was the 80s. We want to start in 1990. You have a corrupt organization which purports to be revolutionary Trotskyists that when the U.S. Marine barracks, by the way, there were 241 Marines, that wasn't going to be the end of it. That was the beginning of imperial military intervention in the Middle East, permanent military installation. And it was defeated by Nazarullah and Hezbollah, their predecessors, their ancestors. We thought it was a good thing. At the time, we said it was a good thing. And and you say, well, one line on the front page of Worker Finger? No. There were polemics back and forth. And they're they're available on our website. Marxism versus social patriotism. And your comrades made some embarrassing <clears throat> mistakes. And they, they outline a position which was false. But you, you know, uh, we we welcome the fact that you're critically investigating many of these questions, but that is a key one. A U.S.-based group with U.S. Marine encampment, U.S. Marine encampment is the most, the, the biggest blow since the war in Vietnam, and you got your, your incorrect leadership said, this is unfortunate, this is a tragedy. When, when they set up these challenger uh, uh, mission to establish, to put in place the most sophisticated Soviet anti-Soviet spy system, and you know which they still have, which is a material factor leading the war in Ukraine, and it blew up. Workers' vanguard said it was a tragedy. I'm not blaming you for it. I'm sure you're prepared to to disavow it because it was seven lifers, seven military. Per but you've got to address it. You can't just say, well, we're not going to look at anything before 1990. Because the problems arose before 1990. And in Iran, the Spartacist League was right. The slogan, down with the Shah, no to the mullahs. That was right. And the issue in Iran, the reason the mullahs won, was that the Iranian left, which was powerful and held all the strategic positions, capitulated. Because they wanted a mass movement, because they were run by tabloids. Yeah. And, and revolutionaries who controlled the oil wells. And it was the Fedayeen, actually, who provided the firepower, who defeated the Shah's hardcore when they came to put down the air cadets. And it was a political problem, and Robertson, to his credit, understood that. He understood it. He could see that this, this mass anti-imperialist movement, led by guys who wanted to stone homosexuals to death and make women wear masks and, and have Torah studies replace science, uh, not to her, but to me. It's all bullshit. Uh, that was a bad thing. And Robertson was right. And we were the only people in the world who said it. And we we had a meeting in Toronto, and these fucking mullah lovers came to break it up. And, and that happened in many places. The Spartacist League was unique in that position, and the Spartacist League was absolutely vindicated. And the 1983 document of the Pavlovites, which we were pre reproduced substantially in our Marxism versus Islamic fundamentalism. They say that. They don't name the Spartans League, but they say, if we'd been better, we would have had the following position, and they write with the Spartans. But you guys say, well, well, you know, but they weren't paying enough attention to the national question. They were, it was, it was terrible. In 1990, you, you, the Soviet Union going down, you guys were, that was another one you were setting out you should have a position on. We said we we supported the hardline Soviet Stalinist coup against Yeltsin and the CIA and the historic leader of counter-revolution in Russia and, and the Soviet Union. And the Spartans League at the time said, well, we, you know, they're both kind of they both they're both pro capital they're both capitalists. Mm -hmm. We said they're both capitalists and the counter-revolution already happened. And we said that, that August 91 was the decisive moment. 1991 is the decisive moment. And 
you come and said, well, it can't be a decisive moment because if it was, then the BT's right. So it was actually 1992. What happened in 1992? Nothing. Except that Robertson changed his mind. You got a group where you can't say a line is unbalanced without being threatened with being thrown out. You're shaking your head, but you weren't around. That's in fact what happened. It is in the IDP. I know you're not taking responsibility for it. To your credit, I'm sure now Gabriel can write something and somebody can say, that's unbalanced. And there'll be no bad repercussions. That's a step forward. But politically, your assessment of your own history, you're getting everything wrong. You're throwing away, and you're considering throwing away the position on the Middle East. Finally, the way that you're actually going to intervene and change the world is by sinking roots in the working class. I called for that comment because I didn't realize it was Chris Taylor, who I do know. The Spartans League had those roots. Howard Keeler led an 11-day shutdown of ships on the West Coast. It's resonating to this day. But the way you do it isn't by putting out leaflets. It's a much more difficult problem than that. And Robertson's contribution was profound. He understood you need to have organized cadres in the working class based on the transitional program. You need a protracted struggle to win a base and to establish yourself as an authority in the working class, which they did, and then capriciously destroy. And again, that history is important by us. And I invite you to investigate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to both counsel. We'll take this case under submission.